All right. So um, thank you so much for coming to this session. Uh, I assume that um, you're here to learn more about what it might take to get carbon negative by 2030. Uh, it's a topic I'm really excited about, and it's a, a topic that came up because um, I think it was Peter last year who just mentioned carbon negative by 2030 in last year's uh, um, uh, Redwood Coast Region Economic Summit, and people like went crazy for it. And so we're like, well, let's let's make a whole session on that. This area, um, the Redwood Coast has has been a leader in renewable energies since really the 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 birth of renewable energy in, in the US. And uh, there's so many opportunities. And what I was the most excited about for this session that we brought together, um, uh, <laughs> what I was most excited about was finding out what is actually going on right now. I mean, I work in this industry. I teach this industry. I should introduce myself. I should also let you know that Layla is logging back in because she's been locked out of the system. <laughs> she just texted. Um, but you know, I I teach uh, at Humboldt State University in the engineering department. I teach renewable energy classes. Um, I work on a lot of renewable energy projects, and I still don't even know all the things we have going on up here. And so, what we've done is we brought together a panel of people who have uh, um, a lot of knowledge of the things going on. Layla's here. All right, um, and uh, um, and I'm really excited to to, to hear um, from them what uh what what they know about what's happening um i'm going to talk for a little bit longer as people are coming in and as we're getting the systems running um and then uh we're going to go through each presenter is going to present for 15 or 20 minutes and then we'll have about five minutes of q a after each one and then at the very end we'll come together with more of an an, an open q a um layla is going to go ahead and start the poll on the side um uh in the sidebar uh, I'm going to turn off my phone. I'm getting a lot of hop in messages. I just need to make sure that one of our one of them isn't our presenters. Okay, great. Um, uh, if you click the poll, hopefully you will now see, um, some polls that we'd love for you to answer. Why are you doing that? I'd like to tell you a couple more things, uh, uh, about myself. Um, Peter, are you answering the polls? I Contemplate, um, contemplating, contemplating. Oh, this is yeah, These it's are hard. good challenges. It's a, it's a good, okay, good. Challenging questions. Nice show. Um, uh, if I was going to share like the thing that I'm the most excited about today, besides this presentation, um, it would be my my new book. I just got in this morning. I'm super proud of it. This is the last proof before it goes out. There's a couple of tiny problems left in it, like the way the text is aligned on the spine. But uh, this this book, of course, it won't have that gray bar. This is just because it's a proof. This book is uh, a book on small scale solar and how to do it yourself and how communities do it. And this presentation today is, is going to be at a slightly larger scale than this. And one of the things that I love about, about us envisioning our carbon negative future is that we really need to hit it at all the scales. And there's so many wonderful spots to jump in. This is a spot to jump in if you're looking at building like a solar schoolroom or uh, maybe uh, solar power for your, uh, um, for your gate or your pond or your rainwater catchment system. Um, uh, and not as much as if you're trying to put five kilowatts on your house. And definitely, you could still use the book for that, but this book is definitely not for building a one megawatt microgrid. And um, I'm really excited to have this segue into our presenters. Um, Layla, do you know what uh, what's going on with the poll? Like, can we share it? Uh, can we share it partway through? <laughs> Oh, once people click them, it shares the results. Uh, great. So if you, as soon as you click one of the answers, you can see where we're at and you can kind of watch it the whole time. It looks like right now we have uh, seven people into all of, into all the forms of renewable energy, one person into other. I'm excited. I bet that that will come up during the Q and A. Um, and regarding the roles that brought you to this session. Right now, we have two people in as a business owner, uh, one person into the economic development, 
and four others. Ooh, we got a lot of others. Oh, we also have a product innovator, designer, and engineer. Um, I'll come back to that at the end of the session. So if you're still thinking about it, click some of those things. Um, uh, uh, really excited to present our first speaker um, speaking on, uh, on what's going on here at the Reba Coast. And uh, um, Jana Ganyan is uh, a sustainable and government uh, affairs director for the Blue Lake Rancheria, um, uh, the Blue Lake Rancheria tribal government. We uh, have the incredible joy of having our students work with Jana quite often to, to develop and evaluate renewable energy systems. What she does there, she's she's there. Uh, um, she leads the tribe strategy for zero carbon resilience across energy, water, food, transportation, and communication lifeline sectors. Uh, she works on policy and climate mitigation and adaptation with tribal, state, and federal governments, and um, uh, and the director of the Redwood Region Climate and Community Resilience Hub, or Core Hub. Uh, incubated at and in partnership with the Humboldt Area Foundation. I am excited to hear what Jenna has to say. Well, thank you, Lonnie. Um, I just want to do a quick sound check. You can hear me okay? Terrific. And now I'm going to try to share my screen. And everyone should know this did not work in rehearsal. So we're going to um, see what we can see here. Um, and if I share something embarrassing, you'll all forgive me. Does that work? It looks like it's working. Um, and let me do one other thing to see if this will uh, increase the size a little bit. How's that? Okay, um, I think we're good. So um, I, I want to thank everyone for joining us um, on an early Friday morning and um, for um, bringing your um, ideas and, and your attention to what I think is one of the uh, most important topics that is at our backs as we think about economic development. Um, this this um, 2030 um, decarbonized resilience goal where the Redwood region uh, can become the first carbon sequestering rural region in the United States by 2030 and prove it up with real math um, is something that we need to do because this is something that the globe needs to do, um, our nation needs to do, and our region needs to do. and. Um, many um, of the people in the audience, many of us um, are already on the path there. But what became clear to us, um, it, clear to a lot of people, is that the decision making and the and the decisions around where we focus our resources as we develop our economies and try to shrink our carbon footprint at the same time, those are going to get. Um, uh, more interesting, in some some ways more difficult, but then in some ways it can be more creative and innovative, and a chance for restoration as well. So um, so it's a time of great opportunity, and um, and the core hub, the climate and community resilience hub, was formed in direct response to um, this need to de-silo ourselves out of our out of our chairs and work with others um, um, as strategic partners to figure all these things out. So this will be different, this slide will be different for everybody, but when we talk about um, climate and community resilience, what do we mean? Well, each nation, region, community, person will have their own definition, but there are some common threads. Um, ideally, clean air and clean water. We need them, we're always going to need them. Um, for this particular session uh, and summit, uh, rewarding well-paying jobs and a thriving economy. We want strong social services. Um, equity is centered so that as we transition to a decarbonized society, the benefits of that transition are 
um, accruing to the most in need first and most. And as we've seen lately, um, we are able to withstand emergencies and issues and recover swiftly, ideally, um, if we do our jobs right, in a better place than we, we were before the emergency hit. And I'll talk about a detail of that in a, in, in a little bit. The Redwood region depends on where you draw that boundary, of course, but you know we have about 140,000 give or take people here. Um, we have it within the Humboldt County boundary, we have eight uh, federally recognized tribal nations and of course um, non-federally recognized tribal communities um, within that boundary. Um, some of those nations are the largest in terms of population and land base. Um, and this entire region is rural, geographically isolated, and as we refer to it, behind the Redwood Curtain. So why are we talking about climate change and resilience and a 2030 goal within the context of economics? Well, um, global climate change obviously um, amplifies our conditions here on the ground. It cascades into multiple emergencies at once, like we've seen over the last couple summers with wildfires, wildfire smoke, um, extreme heat, and that over the top of COVID. Um, it's increasing the temperatures on land and in the oceans. And of course, for us here on the coast in the Re Re Redwood region, um, that's an economic issue because we rely on the health of these ecosystems for our, our livelihoods, um, our, our, our cultural needs, um, and other just sort of key lifeways that, um, that are ocean-based and ocean-reliant. And of course, oceans have been absorbing the vast majority of the temperature increases from climate change um, since the since the 1900s, and this is what this graph is showing, that in the top 700 meters of the ocean, um, the temperature is steadily increasing, and so the the tribal and and other scientists are telling us that once the ocean reaches its critical mass of being able to absorb um, that much of this temperature increase, our issues on land are going to get a lot worse. And of course, we're already seeing here unpredictable, volatile weather. Um, we've got, we had a, we're in the middle of a 20 year drought, which isn't necessarily volatile, but that um, is also coincident with um, atmospheric rivers. And um, one example of that was um, a few years ago in Arcata, we had a rain bomb, which the experts at HSU sort of took a back of the napkin calculation and figured out that we had two inches of rain in 30 minutes. Um, that's the uh, somewhat the equivalent of these rain bombs we've been seeing across the globe that have led to flooding um, and systems being overwhelmed and other issues. Zooming out a little bit to the national picture, um, the 20, 2020 um, saw the most billion dollar weather and climate disasters ever. Um, this is just a graph of that. But we need to keep in mind that impacts um, are to infrastructure, which is of course economy enabling, and they accrue first and most to disadvantaged marginalized communities, which of course um, presents an issue for um, of all kinds of uh, economic and social detriment. Uh, Certainly here um, in the West, um, in our region, we have seen increased wildfires and air pollution. Um, this has led to uh, public safety power shutoffs and rolling outages um, from heat domes that it have impacted the entire West at the same time. And of course, um, in, in our, our first public safety power shutoff event, and again, these are pre-planned grid outages to prevent wildfires from the electrical system. Our first one here was in 2019. It lasted for about 28 to 30 hours, um, but even just that short amount of time created serious economic havoc. 
um, for businesses, for people um, who are struggling um, uh, with their households and their jobs. Um, we, we, we need to um, make the climate change conditions that lead to these events um, less in severity as, as we increase our resilience to these events, uh, because these are predicted to continue until we get the climate calmed down. So that's our work. Um, here on the coast, Humboldt County is experiencing the fastest level of sea level rise, net sea level rise on the Pacific coast. It's a combination of plate tectonics and, um, uh, and sea climate amplified sea level rise. But the bottom line is that it, it's going to have some impacts. It's already having impacts to our um, low-lying communities. And this includes water and wastewater systems, our anchor natural gas power plant, um, and the local nuclear waste repository that's right adjacent to the natural gas power plant. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Um, us in the Redwood region, we know uh, we have seismic and tsunami risk, although I will say that due to our relatively low population, if we get a Cascadia subduction event that hits the entire Pacific coast at the same time, we may not be the first priority for emergency response. So that leads to you know, a, a, a sense of urgency about our day-to-day -day resilience in the event of that um, low frequency, but high damage kind of event. Some of you may not know, we have pretty tenuous connections to our natural gas grid. So um, our region is served by one 10 inch natural gas pipeline. It essentially runs over Highway 36. Um, it's it's uh, depicted here in this image in the orange box. Um, two things to remember, one, our anchor, natural gas power plant um, runs because of this pipeline. Um, it provides most of our actual electrons uh, used here in this region. And, um, and that plant site will be inundated by sea level rise and groundwater intrusion um, by about 2050, which is a blip in terms of the um, timeline needed to reorganize and, and move that kind of infrastructure. At the same time, PG&E in California are looking for ways to prune back our natural gas system. And although they are not looking at our limb sticking out here, our limb to serve 140,000 people or so um, looks, uh, <laughs> it, it's hanging out there a ways and it could be something that they look at for pruning. Although I wanna assure people Nobody is coming after our natural gas right now, but it is important to uh, plan for this, for climate and for real um, uh, local resilience. We have tenuous connections to our electrical grid. We can only import 70 megawatts in our over the existing wires, which means it's about half of what we use on any kind of, at any given moment in Humboldt County. This means that we need more electrons here um, within our Humboldt County grid. This image is the Humboldt County Island. Um, it is the parts of the county that, that stay energized in a right, public safety I think I got it. Sorry, Lottie, oh. did you say something? No, we're good. We just oh, okay. got Matthew on, thank you. <laughs> oh, great, hi, Matthew. Um, so uh, the point is that when we think about what we need for energy systems, um, ideally, they're zero carbon, but we need more generation. Um, and um, the Humboldt Island is a temporary fix, especially if that natural gas power plant goes out. For any reason, we are in the dark. This is one of the most important slides that, that tees up why we have to reduce carbon emissions. Um, this is the sea level rise projection based on the latest California statistics um, and how Humboldt Bay will look in the year 2021, or 2121, 100 years from now. So it's kind of a mirror image where um, all of this area is now the bay. And the areas that you see here and here are the areas that, whoops, 
around here that will be above the water um, uh, if we don't armor, which we would armor some of it, but, but it's coming. And so if I were in charge of economic development um, for this region, I would be focusing my efforts on these areas that are going to be above the water in a hundred years, because in 50 years, um, if these things start to be undermined, um, we don't know the exact timeline, of course, but we know that this is pretty solid for an economic development um, um, picture. And so uh, I just encourage people to take a, a look at this and, and factor it into their thinking as a, um, as a baseline consideration. So as I move this into um, my Google Chrome um, thing, it, it kind of messed up the, the spacing, but in my last couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about how do we get to carbon negative? Um, why? We just talked about why. We need to get there. It'll be better for the economy <laughs> and it'll be better for all of us if we do. Um, how? Uh, the Core Hub is going to, um, it has a project to basically de-silo the existing carbon accounting um, and wrap in um, the, the mandatory um, carbon analysis that's being done by cities and counties and the state and tribes um, according to their regulation, the voluntary accounting being done by businesses um, and other, other um, parties that may have set voluntary carbon reduction goals, um, we're going to look at how scope one and scope two, we don't, we won't go into the details there, but this is sort of a common methodology to look at a carbon footprint and what those numbers are. And we're going to develop a recipe here that hopefully is simple to implement, pre prevents gaps and, and what, and the lovely world word leakage um, so that we're not double counting our carbon emission reductions and we're not forgetting to count carbon emission reductions. We're going to include public and private sectors. So you can think of forest lands. There's public forests, there's private forest lands. Both of those um, sectors would be included in this recipe. Um, and then we're going to use our local expertise to come up with the math, the accounting, um, and we're going to bring in outside experts where we don't have the expertise to do that. Um, and we're going to center frontline marginalized communities um, in this work and get them more involved and in these discussions and at these tables. Um, and I think that my time is almost up. This is a slide about um, the core hub. So uh, again, we don't have time to go into any significant detail, but um, one of the ways in which we can think about our region is that we are, as Lonnie mentioned, already well positioned as leaders and innovators in climate and community resilience. Um, but this work is siloed. We need to de silo it and work together. This is how we got our microgrids built at the Rancheria. We didn't go it alone. We brought in a bewildering array of experts, including the Shots Energy Research Center, Redwood Coast Energy Authority. Um, PG&E, the California Energy Commission, the Department of Energy, the National um, Energy Labs. So strategic partnerships are, are part, a core part of our core hub uh, um, work. How do we de-silo things and get to work on this um, climate community resilience we need? Um, and we know we all need more resources. So decarbonized resilience is the work of the day. We can exercise here in this Redwood region early actor advantage. So somebody has to go first and hit these goals, goals early. It might as well be us. And it, we might as well um, document what we do so that we can help others get there as well. It's going to calm and cool, cool the climate. Um, and we're going to get to where we need to go. Um, so uh, more information at the redwoodcorehub.org website. Um, I uh, have this dual role. Um, the Blue Lake Rancheria tribe is one of the many partners 
um, that have helped get the core hub off the ground. But at the end of the day, we are a convening mechanism that takes an equity lens to climate and community resilience. And you're going to be seeing more of us in the community and we're gonna get a lot of great work done together. And I thank you for your attention. Nice work. Yeah, I can I can hear I can hear people clapping. I can see Peter clapping. <laughs> um, and uh, fantastic work on your timing as well, by the way. Uh, if you're in the audience, and you have a question for Jana, please put it in the Q&A tab that's in the upper right. We will also be coming back together at the very end for questions for all of the panelists. So if you want to wait and see how Jana's work connects with what Peter and Matthew are going to be talking about, that works as well. Um, uh, and I think um, could uh, just to make sure the Q and A tab is working, um, uh, maybe Layla or Peter, could you type a question in there? Doesn't even have to be. Um, uh, oh, there we go. Sweet, we have a question uh, from Peter Alstone. <laughs> Peter, I'm so glad you asked that question. Welcome and thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> um, the other partners in the Core Hub so far um, are, it's, it's incubated and anchored at the Humboldt Area Foundation. Um, and the, the Humboldt Area Foundation and Wild, Wild Rivers Community Foundation um, CEO, Bryna Lipper, um, is on our advisory council. There was early formational work and help from Matthew Marshall and the Redwood Coast Energy Authority, from Arnie Jacobson um, and team at the Schatz Energy Research Center, um, uh, from Mike Wilson, uh, super, Humboldt County um, Supervisor, um, and, uh, and actually a, a host of other people that um, provided early work, um, early input into um, into crafting, you know, essentially why, um, what, and how, um, and 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 we spent a lot of work um, talking about: Do we really need this? You know, we needed to be sure that we really needed this. And I'll say that we do. Um, part of that is because a lot of the funding for climate resilience coming down from the federal government and the state government with the governor's new $15 billion investment takes a regional approach and expects there to be um, a consortium of individuals that are involved in whatever project or, or funding application is put forward. So uh, we see the need, um, it's already happening and um, and we look forward to doing this work. Thank you so much, Dana. Uh, uh, really appreciate it. And I look forward to our final Q and A at the end of it. Um, uh, uh, one more clap. I, you know, we'll be able to feel it through the airways. Thank you. Very nice. We love Dana. Um, and uh, uh, oh, thank you. Uh, I can see how we go now. Um, I am excited to introduce our next speaker, Peter Allstone. Uh, um, I get to work alongside Peter quite often. Uh, um, Peter is the is a faculty scientist at the Schatz Energy Research Center, uh, um, which is on campus uh, and does work all around the world. Incredible organization. Hopefully, we'll hear a little bit more about it. It's also the first place I had an internship. Peter, I don't know if you know that, but I thought I was going to go to prison for the work I did on renewables until Schatz gave me a job. It was 20 something years ago. I was building solar in like squats, like just trying to make off grid living in, in the middle of city sometimes. And then Schatz is like, you're having an internship. It was amazing. Um, so Peter's a faculty scientist there. He's also an associate professor in the ERE department, the Environmental Resources Engineering Department at Humboldt State. Um, at the Schott Center, Peter's research focuses on distributed energy systems, demand response, global access to reliable energy, microgrids, off-grid solar, California energy policy, and also air quality, because these things all like connect. Um, and I think you saw that in, in Janice's talk, and I, I think you'll keep hearing that. 
Um, he's got this interdisciplinary approach where, where he combines this, this data science and field research and also technology research and development and social science analysis all together. He earned his BS in chemical engineering at um, North Carolina State University, his master's in environmental systems at Humboldt, and a PhD in energy and resources from uh, Berkeley. Uh, then that was followed by a fellowship at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, where he now holds a guest appointment as a faculty affiliate researcher. I'm so excited for what he has to share today. I was looking at his slides earlier, and they're gorgeous and dense, and I'm so excited to hear your words with them. Yeah, thank you so much, Lonnie, for that kind introduction, and thanks you all for joining all of us today this morning. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to get to talk a little bit about the work that we do at the SHOT Center. As Lonnie kind of alluded to, um, pulls in all different directions using lots of different methods, um, lots of people involved. So I'm, I'm gonna convey some of the work that I've been involved with, along with some work that others are doing at the center that I, I cheer on and kind of get to see from the sidelines, so to speak. Um, I'll get my uh, screen share rolling here and then we'll jump in. All right. So has everybody seen my, my slide? Looks like it. So I, um, you know, this session is about carbon negative by 2030. And where I went was, well, so much time and so little to do. Oh, wait, you know, strike that, reverse it. This is, you know, Gene Wilder's line from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. It's obviously the opposite of that. We've got so much to do and so little time. 2030 is this decade. So what are we doing now? We're, it's, it's not time for paper studies, it's time for action. Um, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about some work that we're doing at the Schatz Energy Research Center and at Humboldt State toward this carbon negative by 2030 vision. Um, some of it is on paper still, and we wanna get that transition quickly into action. And I hope that some of the conversation that's spurred today and kind of continues in our community through the core hub and other forums is really gonna help move towards that action. So how do we get to carbon negative by 2030? Well, it's really one chocolate factory at a time. You know, it's like we gotta do one factory and then one solar array, one microgrid. Ultimately, it's about all these projects that need to get done. And there's a really nice framework for thinking about how to decarbonize and four pillars of decarbonization that are defined by a paper that I'm, uh, there's a link for here um, and you know, by Jim Williams and authors, four pillars here for climate stabilization. So first we need to clean up the grid, install lots of renewable energy and decommission fossil fuel. Advance efficiency, we have to use less energy to achieve the same quality of life. Electrify everything, switch from burning fuel for electric and switch over to heat, uh, or sorry, electricity for heating and transportation. Uh, and um, Unfortunately, that's not enough. We've already emitted so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we really need to capture carbon. Hence this kind of carbon negative need. Um, pull carbon out of smokestacks and out of the atmosphere. Um, we actually have the best technology in the world to do that in our backyards. Literally, it's the trees in our forests, in our landscapes. Um, we are you know, blessed with this potential carbon capture system that doesn't require patents and technology and IPOs. Um, it really just means uh, reconnecting and um, finding ways of living the right way on the land. Um, and also, as Jana mentioned, we're facing the rough edge of climate change already. So we need to build these systems in a way that are resilient and adaptable to that reality that isn't gonna go away. Um, you know, Even if we turned off all the emissions today, we would still be facing a lot of the extreme weather impacts um, that we're seeing, the kind of continued inertia of sea level rise for the rest of all of our lifetimes. So that's, that's just not gonna go away and that's the reality that we have to, to work within. So my presentation today is really meant to be four quick updates on recent work at the Schott Center at Humboldt State that highlights the kind of opportunities and needs in our region for advancing towards that vision. So I'm gonna start by talking about the SAFE project, it stands for Smoke, Air, Fire, and Energy. Um, really cool interdisciplinary project that I get to be a part of right now. 
um, offshore wind power studies that other folks at the Schott Center are leading and are um, working on. Um, it's a big opportunity for our local region. Um, I'll highlight a study on low carbon heat pumps. It's kind of one of these foundational technologies we need to decarbonize the heating system. And then talk about Cal Poly Humboldt, you know, my professor hat. I'm, I'm here at Humboldt State University. I'm excited about the possibilities that are uh, in front of us with transitioning over to be Cal Poly Humboldt and what that could mean for our university and for the region. So I'll, I'll start with the SAFE project. Uh, SAFE, as I mentioned, stands for Smoke, Air, Fire, and Energy. And this is a collaborative community-based project with the Blue Lake Rancheria Tribe, the Karuk Tribe, Department of Natural Resources, and the Schott Center. Um, so we're bringing together a real all-star team here coming at this wicked problem from multiple angles. Um, the big question that we're addressing is, how can we accelerate progress towards community-defined needs for clean energy and clean air infrastructure in rural California? And, and this is all working within the reality of a changing climate and suffering from over a century of fire suppression and exclusion of indigenous management from the landscape. So what we're seeing in the, the maps that are shown here, this is not our work, this is other folks' work. Um, that's cited in the bottom. They looked at future fire impacts on smoke concentrations, visibility, and health in the United States. Uh, so the left-hand map is kind of the status quo to what it was in 2000 um, and shows the um, particulate matter, which is the most concerning constituent of smoke, the concentration of particulate matter associated with wildfire smoke. And you can see that our region is the epicenter here. It's the epicenter for wildfire smoke impact, and it has been for a long time. As, you know, um, as climate change continues to add stress to our already stressed forests and air system, um, we would expect more and more wildfire, more extreme fire behavior, more smoke. And the map on the right is one possible future. You know, obviously, we don't know what it's going to be like in 2050, but this is one future under um, and if you recognize RCP 4.5 as one of these kind of business as usual, keep burning fossil fuel climate scenarios. Um, what it shows is that we have continuing increased smoke in our region and lots of other regions in the United States are facing these risks. Um, so we need to handle things here and we could also develop expertise to help others. Um, so the way that our project is approaching this is we're looking at kind of three core elements of clean air and clean energy infrastructure that could be part of the solution. So air filtration to maintain health and enable community continuity. Um, you know, one of the things that we went into this project thinking was we're gonna do clean air shelters and people are gonna go to clean air shelters on really smoky days. But the reality is that there's so many smoky days in our region that that's just not tenable. We're not gonna have everybody pick up their life and go sit in the gymnasium of the high school all day, every time it's smoky. We really need to get all of our buildings resilient so that life can continue in our region during times when it's, there's a lot of smoke. Um, and we're working on uh, design guidelines and community um, outreach strategies to help to make that reality. Um, we need more air sensors to provide up-to-date up information about smoke our project's been installing purple air, low cost air quality sensors throughout the mid Klamath region to really increase visibility. And we're already seeing, hearing about the benefits from those and um, are gonna be exploring, expanding that sensor network even more. And then of course, um, we've got these threats to our energy system that are related to uh, wildfire risk, the public safety power shutoffs, along with the kind of standard risks that we face to our energy system. Uh, microgrids and resilient clean energy for households, public facilities, and whole communities could be part of the solution here. It gets more renewable energy out there to mitigate climate change, and it's also adaptive and resilient to the, the reality that we're facing. So unlocking these solutions to intertwine challenges of air, fire, and energy systems, um, these are all systems that are under stress. Um, uh, there's a lot of risk, and what we see is that we need to do these infrastructure um, elements and 
find ways of supporting indigenous led prescribed and cultural good fire that has part been part of a sustainable landscape management for millennia. So these infrastructure elements, the way we conceive them are supportive of that broader vision of bringing a sustainable indigenous led landscape management strategy back to our region. And we're real excited about the, the work that we're able to do um, with our tribal partners on that. All right, so that's the safe project. That's one. Um, now for something totally different. Um, offshore wind is a, a major uh, potential renewable energy opportunity for our region. And the Schott Center has been active on um, scoping uh, for offshore wind um, off the coast. So on the right, it shows the kind of offshore wind turbines that we've been thinking about. Um, because the water is so deep on the West Coast, you have to have floating offshore wind turbines. Uh, these are actually fundamentally wind turbines that are attached, attached to oil platforms, really. It's oil platform technology is being repurposed and reused for wind turbines. And I'm personally fine with that. Um, you know, there's been billions of dollars invested in oil infrastructure, unfortunately. Um, we don't have to throw all that knowledge away. Let's reuse it and put it towards renewable energy here. Uh, uh, so these are floating offshore wind uh, turbines, really large. They could be fabricated and constructed in the uh, in the uh, Humboldt Bay and towed out to sea. It turns out that we have some of the best wind resource in the world off our coast. That's on the map on the left. Um, and we there's a major economic development potential if this goes to scale. So the, the graph in the middle shows kind of pilot scale, 50, 150 megawatts, and then more like full scale deployment 1,800 megawatt deployment um, where we could have billions of dollars of construction phase investment that flows through this region uh, to help build this new industry. Um, at that 1.8 gigawatt or 1,800 megawatt scale, that would be enough winds to support something like 4% of all California's electricity needs. Um, we, of course, are going to have a growing electricity need as we decarbonize, as we add electric heating and electric transport. Um, so this is one of the tools that we have as a state, and our region could play an important role for uh, kind of developing this resource. There's a lot more to the work that's been done at the Schott Center, and you can find it at schottcenter.org slash wind. Um, and I want to you know, acknowledge all my colleagues' hard work on that. Uh, another opportunity. We're working on lots of stuff. There's lots of opportunities out there. Um, there's a, a study that we did recently looking at the national opportunity for decarbonization of the heating sector and really focused on heat pumps that could supply hot water and industrial heat below 150 degrees Celsius, which is 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So what's a heat pump? Um, there's actually one in every single one of your houses, I think. Um, and except you call it a refrigerator. So uh, your refrigerator is a magic box that stays cold somehow when it's plugged into the wall. Um, it has this technology in it that is a heat pump. Uh, the way a heat pump works is it takes refrigerant, which evaporates and condenses in really fun, interesting, but predictable thermodynamic ways. And what we're able to do is pump that refrigerant in a cycle in order to pull heat out of your refrigerator and push it into your kitchen. That's that nice warm air that comes out from the refrigerator. The idea behind heat pumps for industrial heating and hot water is just to take the same kind of technology and flip it around, reverse it. Um, we want to pull heat out of the ambient air and put it into your hot water tank for domestic hot water or into your beer fermentation vat or any other process that needs heat. Most of the ways that we get heat now have to do with burning fossil fuels. And across the United States, we identified 520 million metric tons of CO2 that could be avoided if we decarbonized with heat pumps in the sectors that we looked at. Just for scale, that's 10% of all the energy sector emissions in the country. Uh, and about two thirds of those emissions are in industrial sector boilers and similar applications. 
huge opportunity here. Um, and the transition to heat pumps would involve significant jobs, about 200 jobs for every 10,000 heat pump water heaters that are installed. Obviously more jobs per water heater when you're talking about industrial facility. Um, so there's a workforce development angle here to the decarbonization strategy. And we found that flexible operation, if you operate these heat pumps to match renewable energy generation, could really improve the value proposition so that up to 95% of customers would actually save money by switching to a heat pump. Um, so we're bringing it back to chocolate factories here. Um, I don't know if you um, expected that, but uh, one, of course, application in the industrial sector is chocolate factories. Um, the, the graph here or the kind of diagram is actually from a European example um, of a chocolate factory that uh, got um, a significant amount of its fossil fuel offline and replaced it with a heat pump. One cool thing that goes on in things like chocolate factories is that you've got both heating and cooling needs. So instead of running a refrigerator for the cooling and just throwing out the heat that you're developing and then burning natural gas for the heat, well, you can just take the heat out of the part that needs to be cold and put it into the part that needs to be hot. So there you get your heat pump doing double duty, super efficient. Um, these are the kinds of opportunities that we could have a well-educated uh, workforce out looking for and taking advantage of. Um, so I know that like we've got Dick Taylor Chocolate and Eureka. I don't know their facility. I don't know enough about the kind of the chocolate process there to know if this is a slam dunk for them. We need people who can go out and do that work, who can go visit those facilities, figure out what's going to work and make it happen. Um, and I want to give a shout out too to Redwood Energy, a local firm that's been working on heat pumps for the residential sector for years. And so there's lots of work in the residential sector as well. We've got some momentum locally here on this and we could, we could carry it forward. All right, and so um, I mentioned workforce, education. Where are we gonna teach these people how to do all this stuff? It's gonna be at Cal Poly Humboldt. Um, so Cal Poly Humboldt is probably gonna be the new name of Humboldt State University in the coming years. All the kind of trend lines look, um, look like they're aiming that way. There's of course up-to-date information on the public website here. And as an engineering faculty member, I'm excited and lucky to be able to be part of all those conversations. So we've got this opportunity to envision and build a 21st century Cal Poly that really meets the moment on climate and all the other critical challenges that we face. Um, and the, uh, the table here shows the new programs that are gonna be developed and launched by 2023, which is like tomorrow in academic world, you know, we're, we're the fall of 22 is next year, and it's only the year after that. Um, so notice that we've got new engineering programs, including an energy systems engineering, bachelor's degree, mechanical engineering. Um, there's an applied fire science and management bachelor's degree that's envisioned, software engineering, data science, cybersecurity, all these different programs. Um, and they're being developed partly with an unprecedented support from the state of California. So the state of California provided $433 million in one-time funding to support this transition, to build new capital projects on campus and to support development of the facilities and the infrastructure and the, cap the human capacity that we need in order to get this done, along with 25 million in ongoing annual funds for these new programs. So it's just a wonderful opportunity and very relevant for helping us meet these climate challenges we can develop the new programs to support the workforce needs of the future. So we can look ahead and develop programs that are gonna be developing the folks that are gonna actually go do all that stuff. There's gonna be an influx of new ideas and enthusiasm if we invite people in. New people come to our community ready to contribute and let's be ready to welcome them and get them plugged in. And we've also got opportunities to build the new campus buildings the right way. Um, that's gonna, lay the groundwork for uh, catalyzing decarbonized kind of best practices for us. So I, I wanna close out just with some take home messages. We need to decarbonize the grid, build renewables at large scale and small scale and everywhere in between. Efficiency in building decarbonization is gonna be important. We need to scale up heat pumps along with electric vehicles. Um, there's, there should be an emphasis on industrial uses that are kind of invisible to most of us 
but are a big source of our emissions, big opportunity to cut burning of fossil fuels. Um, our forests, energy, and air are critical for us. These are sis uh, linked systems and significantly stressed, and we need action on multiple fronts to restore indigenous management practices and upgrade our energy and air infrastructure to adapt to those new realities we're facing. Um, and finally, let's educate the folks who are going to make it happen. You know, at Cal Poly Humboldt, we can work with regional partners and really support the training needed to catalyze innovation. So you can tell I'm, I'm super excited about this stuff. I really feel lucky to be able to work on it every day uh, with folks like Lonnie and Jana and uh, Matthew, everybody else in our region. I'm happy to take a couple of questions um, and also to hear what Matthew has to say. Thank you, Peter. We're clapping. Some people found the clap emoji in the chat. Um, uh, Layla says that that was inspiring. Uh, if you have any questions, please put them in that Q&A part. Um, I'll look at those again in a second. And then, of course, at the end, we can do uh, one for the whole group. Um, uh, uh, people are saying claps, thumbs ups. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Thanks also for the shout out to the uh, one of the many local innovators we have working on this Redwood Energy. I get to work with them on some of their heat pump studies. Uh, they've been able to, to prove that, that going all electric for multifamily housing, installing heat pumps, is not only far healthier for the, in, for the residents and better for the environment, but it's actually cheaper. It's, yeah. less, it's less money um, than, uh, than the you know, ways that they, we have been building. That's awesome. You know, I'm glad you mentioned multifamily housing, too, because that's another one of my kind of climate ideas needs for our region is we're a climate refuge. People look to this region and they say that's the kind of place where I could go and have some kind of resilience to climate change uh, because we are coastal and our, our forests don't burn as often as the forests in the Sierra. Um, so. I think it's kind of a moral imperative that we need to be ready to accept climate refugees to this region and to build housing where they can live. So we, we know that there's a housing crunch and crisis in our county right now. And multifamily housing that's built the right way right up front could be a great way of not only like building the right decarbonized housing, walkable to services, but also getting folks um, to our community and getting them stable in a way, um, you know, where they can live. So. Thank you, Peter. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, do one more uh, chat, which is uh, Amy's says, what if humble, or what if Cal Poly Humboldt offered a climate resilience leadership certificate for civic leaders? Thought you might want to address that. And, and also I want to, point out to everyone that Aisha said, uh, posts a link that might be really interesting, which is the County of Humboldt recently published the draft multidisciplinary regional climate action plan on their website. Um, but Peter, if you can address Amy's comment, and then we will introduce Matthew. Yeah, thank you, Amy. That's a really cool idea. Um, I haven't heard that and can take it back to our, our committees um, uh, who are all kind of hashing through what we're developing. Um, that's great. I, <laughs> I, I love the idea of, you know, something like it would probably have to be evening classes. I know that all our civic leaders are busy during the day. Um, but it's the kind of thing that like creative thinking about how our university can better serve the region, I think is exactly what we need in this moment. So thank you for that. Thank you. And, uh, Amy, I know that HSU is working on two different sustainability certificates and, the Cal Poly plan does have a resilient engineering uh, uh, track being planned for, uh, was that 2028, Peter? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff coming up. You know, I would encourage anybody who hasn't done it yet, if you're interested in what's going on on Humboldt State's campus, and I know a lot of people are like, nobody says what's going on. It's not transparent. Well. There's actually this pretty long document that's called the prospectus that's, you know, the it's the Cal, you know, Humboldt State Polytechnic Prospectus, where there's 100 pages of vision there, including specifically what programs are envisioned, the priorities. Um, so there's there's lots of information there. I encourage folks to go look at that um, and and read it. I think it's 
it's just a long read. So not everybody, <laughs> not everybody wants to read it, but, um, but that idea, Amy was not in there yet. So that's a cool one. And we'll, we'll bring that back. Awesome. Thank you so much, Peter. I went ahead and posted a link to that perspective uh, in case people were interested in that. Um, uh, excited to introduce our, our last presenter today, oh. Matthew Marshall, who's the executive director of the Redwood Coast Energy Authority. Um, he's got 15 years of energy consulting and program management experience, um, and he's been the executive director of the RCA since 2010. Uh, and during that time, he's expanded the organization into areas of alternative transportation vehicles and fuels, community scale renewable energy, and community choice aggregation or community choice energy uh, programs. Matthew, really excited for what you have to share with us. Take it away. Great. Th thanks, Lonnie. Uh, and... You're muted. Let me oh. unmute you. I think I manually did that. There we go. Oh. Oh. Thanks. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, Thanks for the introduction. And you know, it's, do you ever have one of those dreams where you're like kind of running a little behind for a presentation and then you're like trying to log in and nothing's working and like, oh, I forgot to send my bio to the moderator. And, and so you know, the, those dreams prepared me well for this morning. Um, but in, in real life, it's good because it actually, you know, no, nobody actually cares if you show up, you know, like I'm not that important and, and also I was speaking last. So it was good that I had time to work it out. So sorry for the technical difficulties. Matthew, if you go back and watch this recording, you'll find out that at the very beginning, uh, we decided that you had a lucrative career as a skydiving clown. Uh, um, that is true. That is on the recording. So, <laughs> so thank you for showing up late. We got to make up stuff. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, all right. So sharing my screen. Let's see if I can figure that one out. Uh, let's share and, a video. Oh, and Peter there. says that we do care. I'm just stalling why. You should see a, a, a box with a red slash through it, which is deceptively the button to yeah, share. Yeah, you. yeah. All right. Let's just share this and then I'll make my screen big and hopefully this will work right. And Peter uh, wanted to let you know or we do care. We're excited to have you here. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just good to put yourself in perspective a little bit, which in dreams, you know, you're not able to, to have that sort of clarity of taking a deep breath. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just kind of go through and, and talk a little bit about, um, uh, you know, a little bit about RCA, but, but, and, and, and highlight a couple sort of strategies that, that are, you know, that we're working on, uh, to, to get to that, um, Carbon negative by 2030 goal, and, and and also you know I think that they're they're strategies that that have a lot of economic development potential. So, um, just as for folks that aren't familiar, um, uh, Red Coast Energy Authority is a, a local government joint powers agency that that's, you know, was formed in 2003 by the County of Humboldt, the the seven cities in in Humboldt County, as well as the the Humboldt Bay Municipal Water District, and you know the, the mission is to really implement sustainable energy. Uh, initiatives uh, in the region, and as, as Lonnie mentioned, you know that that ranges from energy efficiency, which has kind of been our bread and butter from the beginning. We work a lot with um, local businesses and and residents and, and local public agencies um, to to EV charging, uh, uh, infrastructure and planning to to renewable energy development. And um, since two thousand and uh, uh, seventeen, we've been the the community choice energy provider for the county. Um, and so if, if, if folks aren't familiar with that, that's basically the, the, the system where uh, uh, local governments can basically take on the supply side of electricity service. Um, and so the, the local government joint powers agency or it can even be a city or a county, um, you know, directly um, is, is responsible for where the electricity is coming from, the, the incumbent, uh, you know, investor owned utility. Um, in our case, PG&E still owns and operates all the distribution system and they still are the interface with the customer. Um, but it's, it's a way to, to provide uh, local control for, um, you know, the, the electricity supply side of things while still kind of having the, the same uh, uh, standard service for, uh, for customers and the same, you know, utility services for the, the delivery of the, the electricity. So we've been doing that for a while. Um, and you know, it, it's actually a, a fairly um, growing uh, model in California, and it's also exists in other states even before California, like Illinois. Um, but you know, as this map kind of illustrates, it's starting to become the the norm in California. There's now over 
um, you know, I think 11 million plus customers in the state served by, by community choice aggregators in our region. Um, you know, we serve Humboldt County. Mendocino County is served by Sonoma Clean Power. So there are our sort of sister um, CCA to the to the south that serves Sonoma and, and Mendocino County. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's an exciting model in the sense that it gives us that control to, to, um, uh, to decide where electricity is coming from and decide how we spend our electricity dollars, um, in, you know, as far as the supply side. And so, you know, for, for our CEA, you know, our, our goal is really about, um, you know, getting to that decarbonization goal, getting off of fossil fuels, but doing that also through local projects. And so, you know, from the beginning, that's been really a focus for us because that lets us spend those dollars uh, within the community and, and invest in our community. So the, the, the first project I wanted to kind of highlight um, is one that's like uh, almost, almost done, or at least almost, uh, you know, uh, powered up, so to speak. Um, and that's the uh, microgrid project that we're doing at the, the county airport. Um, and so, you know, the it's been something that's a it's, it's a partnership, and I'll talk about the partners involved and, and you know, what we've been working on. But um, it's it's a, an exciting project that's um, building off of a lot of work both at Humboldt State and the, and the the Blue Lake Rancheria as well have kind of been um, key pioneers, and so um, we're we're working with many partners to kind of take a, a next step in that direction. So if if you have no idea what a micro grid is and, and, and why you'd want to do it, you know, the, the, the definition is basically uh, an interconnected system of loads, you know, of, you know, energy uses or energy facilities that are using energy, as well as, um, you know, uh, energy generation resources or storage resources or, or control resources um, that can connect and disconnect from the, the broader electricity grid um, so that you can either run sort of in parallel while the grid is up and running, or if there's a, an, a, a power outage, you're able to, to basically kind of use it as a backup power system in, in what people call island mode. So you're kind of islanding your little part of, of the grid. So it, it's basically like a really sophisticated, you know, backup generator, but with multiple components and also with the ability to, to operate, um, you know, while the grid is up and running, not just like a diesel generator that you kick in, um, you know, only during outages. And so if, if you do this with renewable resources, um, you know, the, the benefits are really that you're able to provide, you know, re renewable power on that day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, putting in a generator, you know, diesel generator, it just sits there most of the time um, un until there's a, an outage. Whereas if you've got a renewable system, um, particularly with storage, you know, you can use that to pr provide power, you know, and, and clean energy on a day-to-day -day basis. But then when there is a, a disruption to the grid, you're able to use that system to, to, to offer um, you know, ener energy resilience and, and backup power. Um, and then, you know, having the, the, the control systems and storage that typically go along with this can, can actually help, um, you know, distributed intermittent resources like solar uh, photovoltaics or PV to, to, to be able to kind of connect to the grid or you might be able to connect more than you otherwise would. And you're able to also kind of manage how that's interacting with the grid and provide, you know, sort of benefits to the broader power grid as far as managing power flows and things like that. And so, um, you know, it, it's a, it's got a lot of sort of various benefits from from emergency response capabilities to 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 clean energy, and um, so it's it's a it's kind of a, a, a the a very sort of um, growing area of excitement for for a lot of uh, uh, folks, and it's starting to really take off. And and Humboldt County is actually a a world leader in that. And so you know you can't really talk about um, microgrids without uh, putting Janice up on the screen as, as a key example, um, you know, and this is, uh, you know, a, a, a cutting edge example of this that's really, you know, not just locally recognized, but, you know, uh, you know, nationally or even internationally recognized as, as a pretty, um, you know, uh, one of the one of the sort of pioneering microgrids um, really in the world. Um, and, you know, with with a lot of technical support from the folks at the, the Shots Energy Research Center, um, you know that's that's a system that's that's here, and, and there's actually kind of additional microgrids being set up. And and um, you know when we had our public safety power shutoffs in Humboldt County, um, you know the it, it sort of proved its value in in providing a location um, you know that that was you know had the power up and was able to serve um, serve the community during those countywide um, outages. Um, so that's that's probably you know 
dare I might say the most famous microgrid around uh, that's gotten a lot of recognition and, and rightfully so. And so we're we're kind of building off of that um, uh, at, 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 you know, example at the at the airport. And so um, this is sort of a computer rendering, but if you take one of the growing number of flight options out of our airport, um, you'll see this as you're landing now because the construction is complete. Um, and so this system is a uh, you know, a, a, a little over two megawatts of solar um, compared with a, a battery system. And under normal circumstances, that will be able to just pow provide power to, to our CEA's customers. It's gonna be putting power onto the grid. It's got a smaller solar array. It looks like one bigger array, but there's actually a smaller piece of that that's actually um, powering the, the, uh, the uh, airport facilities directly. And that's gonna save the county about $50,000 a year in energy costs. Um, and then there's the, the control systems that allow us to, to, to basically separate um, uh, the, the microgrid area from the broader power grid. And, and what's sort of cutting edge and unique about this project is it's the first sort of front of the meter multi-customer microgrid in, in uh, pg and territory. Um, and one of the first, I think, you know, anywhere. And that, you know, the, the sort of what you might say is a standard microgrid is usually like a single kind of customer campus like the Rancheria system, you know, is, is a Rancheria, you know, uh, you know, complex of buildings that, that they own and control, and they basically have the ability to sort of disconnect, um, you know, their their own kind of little mini grid um, that, that that they own and, and control um, from the rest of the grid. And so, you know, military bases, you know, university campuses, those types of settings, we've got a single customer, um, and and their own sort of localized grid that they're able to island is sort of what you might say is the standard configuration. And so this one though, is actually using the pg e distribution system. Uh, you know, so our CEA is, uh, owns and operates the solar and the storage, but pg e still owns and operates the, the power grid that's um, powering not just the, um, the airport, but also the Coast Guard Air Station and the other facilities that are on that branch of the power grid. So the, you know, the animal shelters out there, the the, the gun club for whatever reason is out there, you know, and so all those customers on that branch of PG's grid will be able to to, to isolate that uh, if there's an outage and then kick over to having this system uh, provide backup power to, to all those customers and, and, you know, the airport and the and the Coast Guard being obviously the, the most important. And so, you know, the the, the partners on this are, are you know, RCEA and we're providing about six point uh, six million dollars in funding for the system. The other five million in funding is a California Energy Commission grant that the Shots Energy Research Center secured, and the the Shots team is really the, the technical leads on this, and and um, you know uh, are are uh, the, the the brains behind the operation, and then obviously the the county is a key partner because they're the host uh, for the system. It's on county land, and and obviously they're a key customer, and then PG&E is a is a critical partner as well because this is the first time that they've basically had a system like this that's actually a microgrid that's powering a little segment of their grid as opposed to separating from their grid. Um, so uh, we, we uh, broke ground earlier this year and, and construction's now complete um, after quite a long sort of planning period. Um, and uh, we are scheduled to, to have the, the system uh, you know, operational by the end of the year. It's actually able to generate power now and it's put a little onto it during the testing phase. So once we finish that testing, it'll be going live. Um, so, so that's you know a, 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 a project that we're we're focused on um, in the near term, and like I said, it's it's almost done. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to replicate those kinds of systems, and they provide a lot of benefits to the community because you know I think as we're going towards these goals of of decarbonization, we need to make sure that we're doing it in a way that's enhancing resilience and reliability. Um, and, and not diminishing those things because you know we we, we can't really comp you know we don't want to compromise. Um, you know, our, our um, energy supply or, or, or our reliability um, in the pursuit of, of uh, decarbonization. But I think, you know, the work at the Rancheria, the other work that the Shot Center is doing, this project um, really illustrate that you can actually improve resilience and emergency response capabilities for folks like the Coast Guard um, uh, uh, while you're also uh, decarbonizing. And so the, the, the last thing I'll talk about uh, um, is, is offshore wind energy, which is a bigger, you know, uh, 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 large sort of long-term uh, effort that's, um, you know, sort of on the horizon and, and, and picking up some steam uh, and, and that I think has a, a tremendous amount of economic development potential for the, for the region. 
So, you know, as as um, Peter mentioned, you know, we have a phenomenal wind resource and, and he showed a map kind of of the California coastline. And I think to put that in context, you know, this map shows the wind resource of the entire United States. The darker is the better. So you can see, you know, Wyoming's pretty windy if you've driven through in the winter, you know that. Um, and there's certainly some some good offshore wind resource on the, the East Coast. But if you look at like the darkest blue, darker, better on this map, you know, uh, the the Northern California, Southern Oregon um, offshore wind resource is really, you know, it's, it's a world class resource that that um, exceeds pretty much anything in the in the country for for total potential. And so, um, you know, the the reason that hasn't been developed is the the floating foundation technology that's necessary that, that Peter mentioned. And so this is a, an underwater view of kind of what those those platforms look like. Um, you know, offshore winds well established in Europe and, and other parts of the world, and it's really picking up steam on the, the East Coast, but those are usually fixed bottom foundations. So uh, here's what that looks like in the real world. So it's not science fiction. This is off the coast of Portugal. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the technology is, you know, now being commercially deployed in Europe, and, and that's where things are picking up in California. Um, in, in 2018, uh, we, we uh, started really working on this sort of in earnest at, at RCA, and we wanted to, to have a community driven process. So we, we issued a request for qualification for development partners to say, hey, we want to actually do this in a public private partnership. Uh, so the community is really involved in the process. We had a lot of upfront stakeholder engagement. Um, and then at that time, Boehm hadn't really done anything up here. So we, we uh, developed and, and submitted with Boehm as the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management that manages federal water leasing. And so we issued a, 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 a request for a, a lease area that was based off of community support and really trying to have this be a sort of a, a, a community app approach to it. Um, subsequent to that, the, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management sort of absorbed our lease area into what's now the Humboldt Wind Energy Area that they're um, uh, planning to, to, to lease out for development. The green area is what we submitted, and then the, the pink area is their uh, now final wind energy area that they developed and, and sort of slapped on top of our area. So the pink area is really what's being considered for, for development. Um, and that whole area isn't going to be filled with wind turbines to start. Um, you know, and, and with those partners we selected, which are um, a company called Ocean Winds, uh, Ocker Offshore Winds, are both European based, but um, you know, international companies and Principal Power is the, the foundation provider. Um, they're actually a Bay Area company, although all their, their work and projects have mostly been in Europe. Um, and so we're, we're looking at doing a 100, 150 megawatt project, which is that sort of middle range in, in the, the, the chart that um, Peter showed. Um, you know, it's not the full build out of that area. Um, it's it's more of like a, a, a 10 to 15 turbine size project, uh, you know, not a demonstration, but, you know, more of a commercial demonstration, uh, you know, um, and this would be about 25 miles off the coast of Eureka. And again, we're, we're, we're pursuing that, you know, the first step to, to move things forward is actually getting a, a lease. And so that has been sort of on hold for a little bit, but the federal government's now moving that forward. And so we're, we're excited, hopefully, to, to, to actually see um, so the, the, the planning work and, and the design work really kind of kick off again. Um, as far as what, you know, that looks like, you know, here's a, a computer rendering of, of a 150 megawatt project, uh, you know, uh, that one of our partners developed. So, you know, 10 turbines, uh, these things are, are very large, like, you know, tall as the Golden Gate Bridge large. So you, you get a lot of power from not that many uh, turbines. Uh, and then on the Economic development side, you know, the the harbor facilities to support projects both uh, here off of Humboldt, but also on the west coast, is a big opportunity. And the the Humboldt Bay Harbor District um, uh, got a eleven million dollar um, uh, chunk of funding in the state budget, and that funding allowed them to apply for an initial fifty six million dollars of of funding. The state funding could basically serve as the match funding for a potential federal grant. So knock on wood. Um, I think later, by the end of the year, beginning of next year, they're supposed to hear if uh, if they got funding from the federal government, um, which is really um, picking up support for offshore wind. And so this is what that um, you know facility would look like on Humboldt Bay, or you know approximately uh, gives a flavor of it at least. Uh, conceptual rendering of uh, uh, updating one of our current docks to to be a, um, a, a an offshore wind hub. And here's just another view of that. And I think, you know, the fact that the, the state specifically carved out $11 million for uh, the Harbor District specifically um, 
shows the level of commitment and interest that there is at the state and, and, and ultimately at the national level for Humboldt Bay really being a, a hub uh, for the region and, uh, you know, and, and the broader, um, you know, Pacific region um, for, for offshore wind development. So, you know, where we go from here, um, you know, we're kind of ramping back up on stakeholder engagement now that the, the BOEM process is moving again after a multi-year sort of lull in activity. Um, and we're anticipating that they're going to do the, the lease area auction uh, in the fall of 2022. And then that's when things will really kind of get moving on the on the development process and the environmental reviews and permitting of, uh, of actually doing a project. So that's, uh, you know, a couple um, highlights, you know, one, one stuff that's, you know, a little bit more distributed and smaller scale, but that's, uh, you know, very exciting, uh, you know, on the resilience front and is happening now. And then, and then, uh, some, some bigger picture things on the horizon, like I said, that um, I think have a lot of opportunity. Thanks. Awesome. Um, uh, Matthew, I'm gonna, uh, uh, first of all, have everyone clap, yay, thank you. Um, we're, people are putting some questions right in the chat window, uh, which is gonna be fine. I'm gonna come back to that. If you don't feel like putting them in the Q&A window, you can put them in the chat window. Um, and, uh, um, I would love to uh, use this time for questions that apply to anyone. If you don't put a name, I'll assume it's Matthew, but uh, uh, all the panelists are you're welcome to answer it. Um, you know, in this presentation, we went through reasons and intersections and solutions like solar, offshore wind, community heat pumps, community choice aggregation, and microgrids, talked about impacts, health, economic future proofing, climate change adaption, and natural disaster resilience. And then the work of organizations and projects we just heard about, like Blue Lake Rancheria, Core Hub, Schatz Energy Research Center, HSU Cal Poly Humboldt, the SAFE Project, and the Robocoast Energy Authority. I'm excited to hear your questions. Let's start with the first one, which is, what kind of base load power options do we have access to here to deal with intermittency and duck curve issues? And Matthew, I think that was to you. Yeah, so so we we actually you know currently have you know I think about close to twenty percent of uh, of the county um, energy load can be met through local biomass generation, which is a base load local resource. Um, you know, it's sort of an older resource, and so you're looking kind of in in, in new directions. Um, you know, bat battery storage is a is a key part of of um, you know helping. Uh, you know, shape renewable output to when people are using power, you know, so the, the duck curve if people are not energy wonks is basically as the state of California has increasingly grown um, the, the solar generation potential, both on rooftops of buildings, as well as, you know, in you know, utility scale systems. Um, you know, it used to be the middle of the day in the summer when, you know, everyone is using their air conditioner was kind of the peak. And now it's actually the evening when the sun goes down because there's the, you know, the, the solar generation in the middle of the day. So you see, you know, people start, they wake up in the morning, they start using energy and that's sort of the tail of the duck. And then, you know, over the course of the day, um, you know, the sun comes up and you see this belly of the duck from solar generation. And then as the sun goes down, but people are still using energy, people are actually coming home and using more when they get off work. You see that, you know, the head of the duck, cause that's that, that evening ramp up and evening peak. And so, um, you know, as we've done more and more solar, that that sort of uh, daily, um, uh, you know, peaks and valleys have have grown, um, and so you know, how do how do we sort of match that? Offshore wind's kind of exciting because if you look at the potent, you know, the the, the average generation of offshore wind, um, it looks basically like that duck curve in the sense that it picks up in the evenings a lot of time, and it's also very consistent. So you know, the 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 magnitude of that resource makes it you know a lot closer to a base load resource. Now that's not to say that the wind blows every single day. And so I think there's still a, a need to, to, you know, figure out, you know, you can't just rely on one resource. And I think that's really the, the secret is, um, you know, both being able to shift loads around um, through, you know, smart buildings and, and, you know, good practices, but also, you know, having a, a portfolio, there's not like a silver bullet of like, oh, if we just do this, then we solved all our problems. It's like, well, how about some wind? How about some solar? How about some biomass? How about some storage? You know, and, and combining those things, um, you know, and, and Peter does a lot of, uh, I think, your work around how to adapt loads to 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 how the, the you know to when the energy is available versus trying to make the energy available when there happens to be loads. 
Fantastic. Um, uh, Peter, Janet, did you want to say anything in, in response to that as well? Um, I'll just chime in with a couple things that um, I think build on maybe um, Sean McLaughlin's question as well. So <clears throat> the, um, the, the base load generation um, that we need, as, as we talked about in the, within the Redwood region, um, we know that we need more generation resources. Um, and if we're going to continue to operate as a grid segment, so um, in the public safety power shutoff events, um, the reason that, that Humboldt County was taken down um, in that 2019 event was because we were um, mechanically connected to grids um, elsewhere that, and we weren't able to separate from them. Now we can separate what they call island um, <clears throat> with this segment, but we need generation within that segment. We need electrons produced within that segment. Um, and ideally they don't come from natural gas, um, from fracking fields that create um, issues for us in the climate and issues for those communities, even though they are elsewhere in terms of pollution. So, um, as Matthew was saying, you know, offshore wind provides us with um, a new opportunity to um, have that generation within our within our grid, especially the phase, kind of the first phase, which will be about 150 megawatts or or kind of equivalent to what we use in the county at, at any given time. Um, and we need to do the work to figure out how that's going to be connected to us um, and what kinds of storage and what they call grid forming infrastructure we would need to have that generation really work for us as a, within our island. So there's lots of technical details, but the bottom line is um, it provides a really uh, solid opportunity for us to generate relatively clean electrons within our grid um, paired probably paired with as Sean was asking um, some storage and maybe that looks like a, a battery storage array that's relatively large or maybe it's distributed throughout the region um, we're we're looking at that um, and there's a lot of economic opportunity to that however um, part of the economic opportunity is just that if we have solid power, um, our economy doesn't have to worry about not having that power. <laughs> to to not, not say that very eloquently, but um, that's really the point. Um, so that would be my comment to the baseline power and the, and the storage. I'm sorry, one last thing is that as we do this, we obviously need to figure out um, we need to do it through the lens of trying to avoid maladaptation, um, toxic hotspots as it relates to um, emissions and all of those other things. So um, some of these combustion-based sources of energy um, have emissions profiles that are not ideal for the climate, not ideal for the, for the immediate community. So we have to look at um, the technologies that we can put in place to control those emissions um, and, and make those sources of energy um, work better in their next generation iteration, in their climate smart iterations. You know, and, and I, I didn't say this before because I was thinking about, you know, Humboldt, but actually, you know, thinking about the, the broader region and, you know, the baseload and the mechanical storage uh, came to mind, you know, so. Um, as far as mechanical storage, you know, that's um, something that's, you know, like having big towers with heavy weights where you use energy to, to pick them up and then when you need it, you, you drop them down and you use gravity as your, you know, um, sort of storage technology. Um, people do that with pumped hydro. And so actually in, in uh, down to the south, um, our, our colleagues at Sonoma Clean Power um, are, are looking at a couple things, you know, um, with local governments down there. And so... Uh, they have a lot of geothermal resource, which when you talk about renewables and baseload, 
um, you know, that that's a, a very much a, a base load, you know, consistent 24 seven renewable resource. And um, so they've actually, I think they've identified you know, what they're calling like a, an opportunity zone in mostly Lake County, but also Mendocino and, and uh, Sonoma uh, to, to hopefully start to develop new um, uh, geothermal resources and using new technology that's got closed loop sort of, I think, water efficient um, systems. And so they're, they're hoping to kind of build out that sort of baseload resource because they have that opportunity down there. And there might be some synergy between our need for transmission for offshore wind and their need for transmission for geothermal. Um, and then on the storage side, uh, um, my understanding is that Lake County is actually looking at doing sort of a, a, a big push for pumped uh, uh, hydro storage, but by using basically tanks and systems that would be um, both uh, a, an energy storage opportunity, but a firefighting like water storage uh, system. So, you know, basically they're like, hey, we need to put in, you know, water for firefighting. And what if we did that with, you know, two tanks and we used it as energy storage. So, you know, kind of trying to pair some some emergency response opportunity um, with, with um, you know, an energy storage solution. I don't know how, you know, what the timeline or kind of the, 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 the technical feasibility of that idea is, but it sounds like something that, that at least I'm told they're working on, which could be cool. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. And I, I love ending with that note, that fun, like looking for connections and function stacking and intersections. I think you saw that a lot in, in each of our presenters, that there's these ways where our solutions can be solutions to more than one thing. Since there's no one solution to our problem, there's also like multiple solutions with multiple problems to address. And, and I think that Humboldt County is uniquely posed to be the, the leaders in that um, and, and being in this small community. I really appreciate everyone's questions and, and your time. Um, uh, Ali's suggesting that you check out the expo area. Um, you can see uh, uh, some presentations there, including RCA's video. Uh, session two is beginning in 15 minutes. Thank you, Ali. Um, you're also welcome to reach out to us on, 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 on other platforms. Um, and ooh, there's a suggestion, innovating and eating our way to a resilient economy. I love eating. Um, will there be food provided, Ali? Uh, <laughs> oh, there's some more sessions. Employee, employee ownership creates rural business resilience. In session 2C, air, airports create opportunities. Um, I will read more if there's more of them there. Uh, thriving minority businesses on the Rebo Coast is session 2D. You can see these in the session area once they're running. 2E is what does equity mean in the cannabis industry? Um, and, uh, and this is the last one I'm going to read and you can see the rest of them. Public art, community uh, revitalization and social well-being in conversation with regional art leaders. Um, I want to uh, just end saying one more time, thank you all for, for your work on this. Um, it's, uh, it's something that clearly we, we have to do for the reasons that, uh, I, I think Jana really helped start us out with, with reminding us of some of the very critical reasons for all of us to be, to be working on this and part of it. Um, it's going to take so much creativity and willpower, and there's a bunch of opportunities for everyone to get engaged. Lots of organizations working on it, lots of places for you to fit in, um, and, uh, appreciate your time. Look forward to seeing you all out there working. Have a fantastic, fantastic session. And one more time, round of applause for our presenters, Janet, Peter, and Matthew. Thank you. I'm going to find my clap emoji. Here it is. And for our moderator. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lonnie. <laughs> thank, thank you, you everybody.